Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second in the 2012 series of the Centre for Public Policy Public Forums. Um, we've had a great deal of interest in this event, so um, there will be people coming in um, after we've started, but I just wanted to make sure that we, we started reasonably promptly. Um, as we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, who are the traditional custodians of this land, and pay respect to the elders, both past and present, of the Kulin Nation, and extend that respect to any other Indigenous Australians present. My name is Helen Sullivan. I'm Professor and Director of the Centre for Public Policy here at the University of Melbourne. Those of you on the Centre for Public Policy mailing list will be familiar with me from my uh, monthly blogs, and I'm very grateful to all of you who take the time and trouble to respond and tell me uh, where I'm right or where I'm wrong and what we should be doing. Um, to those of you not yet on the Centre for Public Policy mailing list, please do think about joining it. Um, that way you get prior notification of our events um, and also have an opportunity to participate in our online conversations. All it takes is an email address which you can leave with us or you can write, register via the website. Um, and at this point I want to uh, just flag for you our next event will be on the 1st of May and will feature the Chief Justice Marilyn Warren. Um, all of that brings me to tonight's theme, which is talking about racism, equality and social cohesion in Australia. Uh, the discussion will be led by Dr Helen Suzuki, who is the Race Discrimination Commissioner um, on the Australian Human Rights Commission. And the respondent will be uh, Dr Milsom Henry Waring, who is a senior lecturer here in sociology at the University of Melbourne. I just want to say a little bit by way of introduction, although I'm very well aware that, that Helen Suzuki is known to, to many of you. Um, I've been in Australia for, for six months now, um, and Helen was one of the first people I met, and she's, made, she's been, apart from being hugely um, impressive individually, she's made a great deal of time to talk to me about um, her experience in the past of the centre and, and what we might be doing in the future, and she's a, she's a great advisor to have on hand. Helen was appointed as Australia's full-time race discrimination commissioner in September 2011 for a five-year term. Uh, prior to this, she was the commissioner for the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission between 2004 and 2011. She's held positions in a range of public service and not-for-profit organisations. She's currently a board member of Multicultural Arts Victoria, a member of the advisory committee for the Centre for International Mental Health at the University of Melbourne, and a patron of New Beginnings, a collaboration between Sudanese and non-Sudanese Australians to break cycles of conflict, and patron of the Australian Arabic Women's Foundation. She's leading the development of Australia's national anti-racism strategy, which aims to promote a clear understanding in the Australian community of what racism is and how it can be prevented and reduced. The Australian government committed to developing a national anti-racism strategy as part of Australia's multicultural policy, the people of Australia. It's anticipated that the strategy will be launched in July of this year and implemented between 2012 and 2015. And public consultations about that strategy uh, have already begun. And we see this event as, as a, um, a continuation of, of, of that consultation as well as a, a broader discussion. Dr. Milsom Henry Waring, our respondent, is Discipline Chair and Senior Lecturer in Sociology at the University here. She's one of the Joint Chief Investigators on the Australian Research Council Linkage Project, Resettling Visible Migrants and Refugees in Rural and Regional Australia, which is conducted in partnership with a range of organisations, including the Municipal Association of Victoria and the Office of Multicultural Affairs and Citizenship in the Victorian Department of Premier and Cabinet. And this project aims to examine the interrelated social, economic and political factors that shape the resettlement experiences of recently arrived and arguably more visible migrants and refugees living, living primarily in rural and regional areas. Milsom joined the university in, in February 2003 and prior to that she was based in the UK. Her research and teaching interests are based around notions of visibility, difference, otherness, blackness and whiteness, specifically in the areas of identity, intimacy, popular culture, new technologies, nationalism and multiculturalism. So we have two expert speakers uh, for this evening's theme. And the format's going to be as follows. Uh, Helen will speak first for about 40 minutes or so, and Milson will then offer a response for between 15 and 20 minutes. We'll then open the discussion for... Um, questions, comments, um, however you want to, to take it, um, and think about the implications of what the speakers have said for strategy, policy and action. Um, and at the end of the session this evening, there will be a small reception, uh, so you are very welcome to stay for that and, and to continue the conversation. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr Helen Suzuki to come um, and give the opening address. Helen. <laughs> Um, thanks very much, and thanks for giving your time tonight. 
Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and to pay respects to elders past and present. Um, and I'd also, um, mainly because it will it be excruciatingly embarrassing for her, I'd like to acknowledge my ex-colleague uh, Karen Tui, who's the acting uh, Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commissioner and uh, who is leading some amazing work in the race um, racism space in the Victorian context. Um, so we live in interesting times, as the um, uh, Chinese proverb says, and we wonder about the next wave of economic challenges. We look at the two-speed economy in Australia, um, the labour market shortages in some areas and um, high pockets of unemployment in others. And what we know is that when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. And it means, from my perspective, that we have to be even more vigilant uh, in monitoring social cohesion indicators in our country. One of the big elephants in the room, I think, is the question of population and how this impacts on the future prosperity of Australia. It also impacts on how we maintain and protect social cohesion. We are fortunate uh, that we do not face the same level of social unrest as we see in many other parts of the world and it's certainly a characteristic of Australian society that should be cherished. I touch on this not because I want to particularly explore in great detail the issue of the uh, population size of Australia, because, but because I think it raises the spectre of many issues that I will face, either directly or indirectly, in rolling out a national anti-racism strategy. The development of the strategy is not just about how we are currently travelling, but about anticipating the likely opportunities and obstacles we will face and charting the best course through them. Tonight I want to explore a couple of issues. Uh, let's start with the macro and the future and what we want to be considered in the future when we look at the economic and social prosperity of Australia in relation to population. I'd then like to explore some aspects of social cohesion and equality and look at what it achieves to uh, what it takes to achieve those ends, and I want to share a couple of stories with you along the way. So if we look first of all at, at multiculturalism, multiculturalism is no longer a social experiment, it's the norm. We live in a world in which physical distance is less and less of a barrier to connecting people across the world. We can no longer consider ourselves the isolated island we once were. Figures suggest that Australia is reliant on immigration for our continued growth and prosperity. If we look at just one sector, that's uh, familiar to many in the audience here, uh, tertiary education is Australia's third largest export income. And in 2009, it generated 18.6 billion and sustained around 125,000 jobs. If we prepare to accept the benefits of a migrant economy, we must ensure that we meet the basic human rights of all who partake in it. We already have the guidelines for what we need to do that. They're clearly set out in a number of conventions and declarations that Australia has ratified, not the least of which is the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. They include the right to security of person and protection by the state against violence or bodily harm, the right to free choice of employment, to just favourable work, work, conditions of work, uh, to protection against unemployment, to equal pay for equal work, to just and favourable remuneration. They include the right to housing and the right to public health, medical care, social security and social services. Unfortunately, Australia's policies and infrastructure are not always equipped to meet these rights for culturally diverse communities. And if I give you just two examples, evidence suggests that a number of real estate agencies now have policies that automatically reject rental applications from people who have obtained bond loans. The rationale for doing this is that people who require financial assistance to pay a bond are more likely to default on rent payments. However, the practical effect of that policy is that those with the greatest socioeconomic barriers, such as Indigenous Australians and refugee families, are virtually being blacklisted from obtaining decent housing. The second example that I would uh, give is uh, in relation to employer-sponsored visa holders um, who are quite vulnerable to work exploitation precisely because of their reliance on their employer's support to remain in Australia. And you may recall the federal court case last year of a Perth employer 
who was found to have paid five Chinese construction workers $3 per hour to work 10 to 11 hour shifts at least six days a week. And four of the men were not paid at all for the first three months of their employment. These are the kind of issues that we will continue to grapple with unless there are effective strategies put in place to cope with the growing population. The sustainable population strategy is an important tool for addressing these challenges and I sincerely hope that activities aimed at improving the delivery of social services and housing which have been funded under this strategy will continue beyond this budget. In whatever future form the strategy does take, we need to continue to consider how this work can feed into other developing policies such as the social inclusion agenda, the national anti-racism strategy included as well. Our work will only be strengthened by better cross-government collaboration. Now, if we turn to the issue of racism, it's true to say that our time since white settlement has quite obviously racist overtones. It's also true to say that prior to white settlement, the continent that we now call Australia was in fact multicultural with many different First Nations people living across the vast expanse of the land. In order to work towards equality and social co cohesion, I contend that we have to admit that racism acts as a barrier to achieving these goals. As a country, we have a strong commitment to equality, but we also have to understand that to be vigilant about equality, we have to identify the barriers to equality. In other areas of gender, we've done this quite positively. The institutional, systemic and overt barriers to women achieving equality are well understood, if not well grappled with. Uh, to some extent, we've done this with disability and age. We can name the discrimination when it occurs, and by naming it, we know how to address it. Race, however, is a different kettle of fish. We're often frightened to call racism when we see it, and there are disputes about what constitutes racism. Look at the recent media debate about the Bolt case in relation to fair-skinned Aboriginal people. Look at how people shy away from talking about racism. The exception to this is often in sport. Many major sporting bodies understand the benefits of naming a barrier to equality. They understand that to keep recruitment open, to keep spectators safe and players interesting and diverse, they need to create environments that are not only culturally competent, but that tackle racism when it rears its head. Racism takes many forms. In general, it's a belief that a particular race or ethnicity is inferior or superior to others. Racial discrimination involves an act where a person is treated unfairly or vilified because of their race, colour, descent, national or ethnic origin. Racism impacts directly on the full enjoyment of individuals' human rights and in particular, the right to equality. Racism is experienced across the spectrum. It may occur in a passive way by excluding people socially or being indifferent to their views and experiences. It may take the form of prejudice and stereotyping of different groups in our community, in name calling, taunting or insults, or in actively and directly excluding or discriminating against people from uh, service, for services on opportunities and opportunities on the basis of their race. For example, in relation to employment opportunities, access to education and participation in sport. It can manifest through commentary or drawings in the media, speeches at public rallies or assemblies and abuse on the internet, including e-forums, blogs and on social networking sites. And in its most serious manifestation, racism is demonstrated in behaviours and activities that embody hate, abuse, violence, particularly experienced by groups who are visibly different as a result of their cultural or religious dress, their skin colour or their physical appearance. On occasions, racism can occur more systemically, as when people with overseas skills and work experience are overlooked for employment, or when job applicants without Anglo-Saxon names have difficulty being offered job interviews. And it is often linked to poverty and lower socioeconomic status, as is the experience of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples generally. 
So racism does exist in Australia. We know this is a fact. We know it's a fact because it exists in our complaints to the Australian Human Rights Commission. It's also identified in research. National data from the Challenging Racism Project was released in 2011 and that gave us information about the prevalence of racism and attitudes about racism. We know from this research that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples continue to experience high levels of racism across multiple settings. The research found that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander respondents returned much higher rates of experiences of racism. In relation to contact, and this included in relation to contact with police and in seeking housing, and in these particular areas, their experiences of racism were four times that of non-Aboriginal Australians. Similarly, in 2008, other research found that 27% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples over the age of 15 reported experiencing discrimination in the preceding 12 months, in particular by the general public, in law and justice settings and in employment. Further recent research has found that three out of four, three out of four of every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples regularly experienced race discrimination when accessing primary health care and that racism and cultural barriers led sub-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to not being diagnosed and treated for diseases in their early stages when treatment is most effective. More generally, the challenging racism research resulted in the following findings. Around 85% of respondents believe that racism is a current issue in Australia. Around 20% of respondents have experienced forms of race hate talk. Around 11% of respondents identified as having experienced race-based exclusion from their workplaces and from social activities. 7% of respondents identified as having experienced unfair treatment based on their race and 6% of respondents reported that they had experienced physical attacks on the basis of their race. This research also found that people born overseas experienced higher rates of racism than those born in Australia and were twice as likely to experience racism in the workplace. Culturally and linguistically diverse communities in Australia are themselves diverse and each community and generation have quite different experiences of migration and settlement. As a result, their experiences of racism also vary. For example, research suggests that settled immigrants tend to experience lower levels of racism or racist attitudes than their more recent arrivals to Australia. In our own work at the Australian Human Rights Commission, Arab and Muslim Australians and African Australians suggest that our work suggests that these communities are at a higher risk of experiencing discrimination and prejudice. This supports previous research undertaken by the Commission that found that visible ethnic and religious minorities, such as Arabs, Muslims, Africans, Jews, Palestinians and Turkish people, are groups that are more regularly likely to be subject to racism. And members of these communities themselves identified that their difference in terms of skin colour, dress and or cultural practice was the thing that attracted the behaviour to them. There are also particular groups within culturally and linguistically diverse communities which appear to particularly experience racism and we see this most uh, in a most prevalent way from the so-called uh, shock jock radio presenters who frequently veer into racial stereotyping and demeaning of asylum seekers and refugees. Our own work with international students makes clear that these temporary residents are often taken advantage of or discriminated against by health providers, migration agents, employers and real estate agents because of their race, or their colour or their ethnicity and often also because of their age. Alarmingly, some research indicates a significant increase in racism over recent years the Scanlon Foundation's Mapping Social Cohesion 2011 report found that in 2010 there was a marked increase in reported racial discrimination and that this increase reporting was maintained in the 2011 survey. And disturbingly, this research also highlighted the awareness of most Australians about issues faced by our First Nations people was very low and very disengaged. A key feature of racism in Australia is denialism. 
Such denial may be genuine, it may be a genuine lack of understanding that an act may be racist. However, there are deliberate falsehoods, misinformation or evasion. Suggestions of racism may also be dismissed as an overreaction, where people think that telling a racist joke, for example, should be taken as just a bit of fun. Too often, stories start with, I'm not a racist, but. Ultimately, racism, and I quote, is a denial of human relationship, yet for many people it remains almost invisible, unnoticed, except when violence is involved. Those who do not experience it often fail to understand how profoundly offensive it is. The other thing we know about racism is that it's bad for us and there is significant research that demonstrates the damage that racism causes to individuals and society as a whole. And I'm not going to explore that uh, in detail tonight, um, but what, uh, and, and the, the research is actually referenced in the paper for further information, but what this research demonstrates is that racism literally makes you sick. More broadly, racism undermines social cohesion within the community. To ensure social cohesion, individuals need the opportunity to secure a job, access services, connect with family, friends, work, personal interests and local community, deal with personal crises and have their voices heard. Racism towards any individual or community undermines the achievement of these goals. It also impacts adversely on the development of Australia as a multicultural society. If we conceive of multiculturalism as a set of norms or principles uh, which are, uh, have human rights at their base and which build on the respect protection and promotion of all of our citizens, then the adverse impacts on groups in the community who may be treated less favourably on the basis of their race is obvious. Multiculturalism supports the ideals in a of a democratic society in which every person is free and equal in dignity and rights, and racism undermines those very foundations. In this country, the first national anti-discrimination law to be passed addressed racism. Australia became signatory to the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination in 1966 and then ratified it in 1975. The ICERT, as it's uh, known as, outlines Australia's obligations to safeguard human rights in the political, economic, social, cultural and other fields of public life so that human rights are ensured to everyone without racial discrimination. The Racial Discrimination Act was then passed in 1975 and that seeks to promote equality before the law for all persons and implements the principles of prohibiting discrimination against people on the basis of their race, colour or national or ethnic origin. The Racial Discrimination Act is also distinctive among Australian anti-discrimination and equality laws in its general provision for equality before the law in Section 10. Unlike most other provisions in the RDA, Section 10 is enforced directly through the courts rather than through complaints to the Commission. And while the number of cases brought under Section 10 has been small, I think it's necessary to name only one of those uh, to understand the importance of that provision. And that case, of course, is Marbo number one. Without this case's finding that it was a breach of Section 10 of the Racial Discrimination Act, for the Queensland Government to seek to confirm that it had <coughs> retrospectively and permanently extinguished any remaining native title over the Torres Strait Islands, Eddie Marbo and his co-plaintiffs would have lost the right to even bring forward the <coughs> argument that there was such a thing as native title that could be recognised under Australian law. And importantly, the Racial Discrimination Act was amended in 1995 to incorporate specific provisions that relate to actions which are likely to offend, insult, humiliate or intimidate a person or a group of people. Now these provisions are also important, although they are contested, in providing additional protections against, for example, race hate. So how do we build social cohesion by addressing racism? We know that racism has an adverse impact on social cohesion and we know that we have to promote equality as well as addressing racism. At a national level, I think we are at a crossroads in the direction of public policy. We now have a multicultural policy. We have a commitment to developing an anti-racism strategy. We have a social inclusion agenda. We have a sustainable population strategy. 
And importantly, we have two other processes that are going on. Uh, the first is the consolidation of all of the Federal Anti-Discrimination Acts into one, well, we hope, a Quality Act, uh, rather than an Anti-Discrimination Act. And we also have the process of co a constitutional referendum on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, which has the potential to remove the racist provisions from our own constitution. In relation to the development and implementation of a national anti-racism strategy, uh, this is also an opportunity to raise awareness of, around racism, and this derives specifically from the People of Australia policy. The government's intention is that a national anti-racism strategy will draw on the expertise of uh, three government departments, um, the Attorney-General's Department, the Department of Immigration and Citizenship, and uh, the Department of Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs, and working together with the Australian Multicultural Council, the Federation of Ethnic Community Council of Australia, and the National Congress of Australia's First Nations People, it's our task to actually develop this anti-racism strategy. The membership of the partnership makes clear that while the anti-racism strategy was born out of the multicultural policy, we are looking at its development through a much broader filter, encapsulating both the experiences of Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, as well as our culturally and linguistically and religiously diverse communities. We've been tasked with designing, developing and implementing the strategy with five key areas of effort. Research and consultation, education resources, public awareness, youth engagement and ongoing evaluation. And as Helen said in the introduction, we hope to have the, at least the start of the strategy drafted by July 2012 with an implementation over the next few years. Now last week I released a discussion paper and called for submissions and we've also run an online survey to try to gauge people's reaction to what will work with a campaign that is addressing racism and to define uh, and, to, and to actually get their ideas about what we should be doing. In addition to that, we're, try we're working on the definition of an overarching concept for the strategy. Both the survey and submissions are open to everyone and I hope you've all got your little business card with the uh, address of the anti-racism website on the back. Um, and I guess... What I would say tonight is that it is a call to action because we need to be able to um, demonstrate through evidence, through interest, through your responses to the submission and more importantly to the online survey that there is an interest and concern about racism and that we should be doing something about it. And ultimately many of the suggestions that are already coming up in the consultations are suggesting uh, more resources. So at least this is the basis to going back to government um, although um, hope of getting money out of the government is pretty low, I think, at the moment. Um, so what I want to uh, demonstrate through this process is if we resolve from talking about racism, we're going to get the country... Uh, we're going to get the country behind... If we, sorry, if we don't resolve from talking about racism, we'll actually get the country behind this initiative uh, and then we need to build the case... Uh, and so what we need really is volume as well as content in the consultation phase. So we really are encouraging you, if you've got good ideas, we'd love to hear from them. What I should say is that an anti-racism strategy is not going to fix the problem per se, but what it will do is it will help us to shine some light on the issues that we're, too, we're often too shy to confront in the normal circumstances or to shine the light on the sort of issues that we often deny exist, the circumstances that exist where people experience racism. And what we hope from this is that it will make Australia stronger, not weaker, in promoting our diversity. Um, there's a wonderful quote from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, which says, differences are not intended to separate, to alienate. We are all different precisely in order to realise our need for one another. And often what we find is we withdraw from difference rather than embracing it. We're threatened by difference, and so this often leads to people being treated differently by virtue of their race, even when we actively recruit them to come to this country, even when they were here long before us. However, if we commit to developing sound policies and programs that address the structural barriers to inclusion, if we work in partnership with communities and NGOs, business and academics, and build on the, our diverse strengths, I believe that we can create innovative solutions to some of the problems that I've outlined. 
Our benchmark for success, of course, should not be that we are better than the worst human rights offenders. As a prosperous and thriving multicultural society, we should aim to be the world's leaders in putting human rights principles into practice. And I want to conclude by um, giving you the opportunity to walk in someone else's shoes. One of the participants um, in our consultations with the African communities told us the following story, and I quote, I got on the bus and there was one seat left next to a woman at the back. But as I was walking up, I noticed that she put her bag on the empty seat. I thought, not again. But I decided I would this time do something different. So I walked up to the seat and I looked at the bag and I said to the bag, did you pay? <laughs> and then I said, what, you didn't pay? The woman quickly snatched her bag and as I went to sit on the seat, she turned her back to me. So I did the same and then the people on the bus started clapping and I felt very good to know that not all people in Australia are like that. When people look back at us 50 years from now, what will they think? Will we be seen as people complicit in allowing racism and inequality in its various guises to exist and continue? Will we wonder about social cohesion and the impact of race and wonder if we should have done more? Or will we be the people who learn from the experiences of the past, harness the possibilities of the present and work to create a different future? And I guess that's the challenge that I'm putting out for all of us to rise to, to meet today. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Helen. Um, so we're going to move straight on to uh, Milsom's response. So Milsom's got a, a PowerPoint presentation for, for those of you who are, are wanting to, to take notes. Milsom. Thank you. Good evening. I too would like to be, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Wajur people of Kulula Nations, and to pay my respect to elders past and present. Thanks to Helen for her informative speech. Um, I particularly welcome the appointment of a full-time race commissioner um, and the broad and collaborative scope of the new national anti-racism strategy, which includes the indigenous um, bodies. These are steps, I believe, in the right direction. But first, let me start with my own background, just to um, give you a little bit of indication of where I'm coming from. Um, I arrived in Australia over 10 years ago, as you can see, as a visibly different skilled migrant who has, though, by virtue of uh, my British background, been able to fit into an Australian society because of the social and political privilege of being British. These varying identities have provided me with a, a very distinctive viewpoint to look at Australia from the outside and from within. And I must confess to being somewhat alarmed by some of the peculiarities of the Australian psyche, especially over the last few years. Um, and more recently, I wrote about this in an online opinion piece, um, which was talking about, well, the title was, Why Australians Whinging? It's time you can take a good hard look in the mirror, Australia. Um, and one of the bits of the article that I focus on, I want to draw attention to today, is why racism is such a problematic issue in Australia. <coughs> so, excuse me. In the piece, I just asked a few questions and the following. I'll read uh, some of them out. Why is there still a reluctance, I was asking, to acknowledge the historical legacy of race and its dissemination of the first Australians? How could a gap between Indigenous and other Australians be overlooked for so long? How could any meaningful discussion um, about multiculturalism seriously be attempted or fully realised without understanding the past relationship between first Australians and the first settlers? Why does it appear to be un-Australian to even to call Australian society racist? How can it, such a narrow and at times inhumane view of asylum seekers, refugees, and some migrants be allowed to dominate and constrict any effective discussion and action? Why aren't we even championing our place within the Asia Pacific regions? It seems incredible, I ask, that these issues are not being seriously tackled, as Australia is in fact in an inevitable position to take advantage of real engagement with its indigenous communities, to extend its multicultural credentials, and to harness the potential of its regional position within the Asia Pacific. So those are some of the questions that I kind of start off when I think about racism in Australia. But also professionally as a sociologist, my teaching and research interests focus on critically exploring difference and diversity. 
And for that, I'm just going to just so briefly outline to you um, some of the definitions of, uh, of racism, which I think Helen has, has hinted at as well. But I also wanted to point out that, unfortunately, the notion of race isn't behind, behind us. Race, and indeed racism, still matters. So it is still highly relevant, even in the 21st century. So defining racism, I'm not going to go into, this is really just about giving you some background um, for the slides. But racism itself, within a, an academic sense, is still a problematic term. Because it stems from a belief that there are biologically different people on the basis of race. Yet we know that there are greater genetic differences between siblings and genders than there are between different races. As a social scientist, then, race is seen as being um, socially constructed, defined by those in power to name, to exclude individuals or groups in both a real and symbolic sense. And racist, racist discrimination are really, then, practices and behaviours that result in unfair and unavoidable inequalities between groups in society based on race, religion, culture or ethnicity and it involves explicit and covert forms of interpersonal and systemic forms of discrimination. And that's a quote from the Vic Health uh, Programme. And we also know that what's happened to the notion of race has, has shifted over time. So that it's shifted from being fairly overt acts of racism to more subtle forms of racism, to institutional and new forms of racism, where cultural difference is asserted in terms such as, I am not racist, but, which are often followed by a highly racist comment. So we should not be deluded then um, <clears throat> that from thinking that racism today still, has, uh, still doesn't have a major role in society. Um, my, I think Helen hinted out, just to briefly um, give you the other context to my role here at uh, Melbourne, is a project which is about linking, which is, sorry, so talking about how visible migrants and refugees resettle in rural, rural and regional parts of Australia. We look specifically at notions of visibility, identity, and community. We've interviewed nearly uh, 400 participants, um, mostly kind of key settlement um, stakeholders, visible migrants and refugees across eight regional and metropolitan areas of Victoria. Um, the further details are there. But the notion of visibility is one area that we're looking at, which I think is highly relevant to tonight's discussion about racism, equality, and socially, uh, social cohesion here in Australia. So when we talk about visibility in the project, um, we acknowledge um, that the recent arrivals to Australia of both migrants and refugees from Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, particularly over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, presents a new um, sort of stage, if you like, in, um, in settlement in Australia. So we are keen to, ignore, to acknowledge and explore the diversity of experiences of visible migrants and refugees, particularly those who settle in rural and regional locations. And we argue that the concept of visibility allows for a more critical and a new focus on the process of settlement. It is our hypothesis then that visibility matters and is a potentially useful concept to explore the experiences of these particular set of newly arrived peoples. And what we mean by that is it's not simply about race or ethnic origin, it's about naming and acknowledging difference, it has a multi-dimensional feature, and it has differential impacts on settlement between metropolitan and rural and regional location, uh, locations. And we also know that visibility, the notion of visibility and indeed invisibility can be seen as both positive and negative. So it's a useful way to explore um, that process. Um, we also know that for many recent arrivals in Australia, as Helen uh, indicated as well, visibility is both a real and symbolic uh, feature of everyday life. And it does have a major impact on the overall sense of self. So our research to date then supports some of the existing research that Helen already outlined from the Australian Human Rights Commission, from the Challenging Racism Research, and from the uh, more local Vic Health localities embracing and accepting diversity, the LEAD project here, all of which point out that racism is real. Further, we support the view um, that the experiences of racism vary considerably and have also varied over time that racism is indeed complex and often difficult to unravel about where it begins and where it ends. But its ability to define, to control and maintain differences and inequalities is profound. So race matters because even though it is biologically disputed, its social impact is immense. It affects our life chances, our influences our health, wealth, status and power. And racism clearly damages not just the individuals but societies because it does prevent social inclusion and threaten um, social cohesion. But how do we talk about racism in Australia? Um, do we, in fact, talk about racism in Australia? 
I don't think we do it enough, or we certainly don't do it with enough um, movement towards action. And one of the key issues um, is that we cannot fully talk about it because there's a real climate of denial, and Helen has hinted that already. And it, this is curtailed by notions in some way that it's actually un-Australian to even call Aust Australian uh, racist. But if we look at uh, one of our two recent prime ministers, um, their understandings of, of racism, we can see that, that it's obviously in quite good company. John Howard said back in 2005, I do not accept that there's underlying racism in society. And even Kevin Rudd in 2010 said that I do not believe that racism is at work in Australia. These are quite damning indictments on the level of racism. And, and as the new, new migrants arrive in here and indeed indigenous peoples, that is quite a shocking statement. So the fact that our two most recent prime ministers dispute the presence of racism reflects Australia's uh, inability to understand both the pernicious and the cumulative effects of racism on individuals, groups, communities, and society. It also illustrates the extent of the denial about racism and the lack of concrete and sustained action by our political leaders. This, I argue, stems from a failure, as I think Helen has hinted as well, to acknowledge the first Australians, to ignore the cult multicultural roots that existed at the time of Federation through to the development of the white Australia policy, and which despite the dismantling of that policy only 40 years ago, it still has remnants in existing multicultural policies. The fact that until fairly recently, it, existing quality laws around racism were suspended when applied to the Northern Territory intervention, or that current political and public discourses about migrants and refugees are still coded as non-white others who do not fully belong, or indeed that there remain key barriers to social cohesion and inclusion for this group, is a daring indictment for the 21st century Australia. So I argue that we need to critically deconstruct this pernicious, pervading, and often all too determinative view or discourse of, of racism. This is a role, though, not only for governments, they can't do all this all by themselves, but it is a role for individuals, communities, and organisations. And we need to learn to adopt um, a zero tolerance of racism in all its forms, as well as celebrating and promoting difference as beyond the negative discourse of otherness. A failure to do this will lead to a waste of all our potentials. But we can't talk about racism in Australia without talking about the link to multiculturalism in a bit more detail and indeed the link to immigration and debates about population. Multiculturalism at the level of policy has in the last couple of years under the uh, current federal government attempted to move from being a dirty word and we re recognise that and welcome that. It's, it's attempted to move away from being a political football and neglected policy to one that offers tolerance of difference in exchange for rights and responsibilities and more critically is seen as a reality that, is, that shapes all Australians, not, those, not just those who are, are non-white. So on one level, that is a good step, but as a policy, it is still, as I said before, rooted in a discourse of otherness which values highly whiteness, and as a result, focus is too much on a narrow conception of equality and meaningful exchange. So as soon as we talk, for example, about the terms migrant, ethnic, and race, this is seen as the domain of the non-white population. And this emphasis makes true and sustainable equality almost impossible to achieve. So what I'm arguing for is that we need to find and redevelop um, a viable, sustainable, multicultural policy and practice which should be about being open to diversity in all its forms, to help us to eradicate the culture of racism in all its insidious formats, to challenge individuals to think and act um, beyond immediate prejudices, as well as providing the legislative teeth to ensure that governments and organisations and others develop and enact an anti-racism agenda. An active and engaging anti-human rights discourse uh, can serve as a really good foundation for critically reviewing multiculturalism, immigration and notional populations, particularly where notions of equality and social cohesion can be realised. So what we're looking for, what I'm looking for, is a holistic approach which does involve all of us. And I think the former um, Commissioner Graeme Inns sort of stated that we are all responsible for naming and saying no to racism. We must call it when we see it. Race hate, racism, careless words can harm entire populations. They can change the way that we live together. Racism then can only be resisted and eradicated through solidarity and cooperation. There are no exceptions. History has no bystanders, only participants. So this does mean that we need to find ways to unlearn racism. 
So I am pleased that there is a beginnings of a strategy at the national federal level, which will, as Helen pointed out, focus on those five areas. Um, and this represents an important shift within the Australian political and policy landscape, and I hope we all support it. I also hope that it will be well resourced so that it can be proactive and flexible in its scope and its recommendations, and it can take into account the emerging research which argues for her, a holistic and sustained approach to dismantling racism in all its forms. So we really need to focus on what this anti-racist approach is. And I'm just going to briefly highlight the, in, the last, uh, in, the, in the next two slides what an anti-racist anti framework would look like. And just drawing on the challenging racism research in 2011, which offers an interesting array of ideas for policy and practice. And as most of us in this audience imagine are either academics or policy workers or activists, um, some, of these ideas, some of these ideas I think will all make sense. But it's all about dispelling false beliefs, encouraging people and encouraging them to feel empathy for others so they can identify with them, encouraging individuals to have contact with members of cultural groups for which they have disdain, for interrogating the notion of white privilege and using it as a strategy to increase people's awareness of the colorblind privilege that particularly comes with being Anglo-Australian that to ask citizens to take responsibility for what happens in public spaces and helping them find ways to do so, to address racism structurally and institutionally, and to use the new kind of social marketing and media tools to counter out existing forms of discrimination. And also the LEAD project, which I hinted at before, has offered us a number of perspectives which are linked into this anti-racist framework, which is about addressing disadvantage, about strengthening minority ethnic communities and, and, and indigenous identity, building positive attitudes and behaviors, building inclusive communities, um, and uh, building inclusive community identities. All these indicate that the policy that we, what, that we develop needs to have firm teeth, as well as being relevant, proactive, and flexible. So in summary, my understanding of racism in Australia as an outsider and an insider is that it's about the past, current, and future failure to understand, to develop, and engage with the concept of difference as beyond the discourses of negative otherness. So what I'd like us to do um, in, the, in the, the questions that will come up is to think about all the possibilities, possibilities opened up by a notion of difference that is not defined or operated or maintained or reinforced in that negative context of otherness, inferiority or competition for resources. Let us take the time tonight to imagine what type of individual, group, organisation, community, society or indeed world could be created outside of those notions. Such a vision would radically change who we are and what we are politically, economically, socially, individually, and collectively. <clears throat> it should be possible, then, for us to conceive of Australia as being truly equal, socially cohesive, polyethnic, where photos of Australian flag hijab-wearing women are not seen as extraordinary, to a position where it is in the potential of all of us that matters to really be that lucky country, and in order to get to that utopian point, let's do more than talk about racism. Let's find the spaces to widen the conversation, to act individually and collectively now. We don't need to wait for any more proof that racism exists. That definitely would be un-Australian. Thanks for listening.